Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another installment of our virtual recovery series. This month, we have two guests with us who are going to talk a little bit about art and how that has helped their recovery. Before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsors, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Cardinal Health Foundation. Um, first up, we have Joey, who is going to be sharing his recovery story with us today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to have you aboard. Uh, my name is Joey Sapina, and I am uh, the actual the executive director of a recovery community organization called Sandusky Artisans Recovery Community Center. We are uh, established in uh, 1996. Uh, we are a 501c3, a nonprofit, and uh, um, it's in our name, Sandusky Artisans Recovery Community Center. Um, how that all came about is my own personal journey. I'm an artist. As you can see, some of the paintings that I've done in the background, I'll be trying to, they'll kind of magically appear behind me, I guess. But um, Years ago, I, I, that's how I made my living. I would just, you know, do art shows and uh, um, sell paintings. And and, uh, and in, in the late, uh, in my early, late 40s, um, I had some uh, health issues. I'm also a person in long-term recovery too, by the way. I need to, I need to bring that forward. Uh, and art has always been part of my, uh, my journey. Even uh, when I was uh, in the falls of, uh, my uh, problem with addiction and mental health issues. But um, in, in the late 40s, my late 40s, I had pretty well been established in recovery. But at that time I was probably close to, let's see, uh, that's, again, in recovery in, in, when I was 26. So you do the math, that's probably 24 years or something like that. But anyway, I had been doing my art and um, I always believed that art healed. I know it healed me. Uh, it just became part of my, um, my life, and uh, that's the way I made a living. And I, how how I, how Sandusky Artisans Recovery Community Center came about was that um, I was at an art doing my art, doing an art show, and uh, some people that had opened up a small gallery in Sandusky, Ohio, had asked if I would consider hanging in their gallery, which uh, which you know I thought okay, you know so. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I'll bring some paintings in and, and I hung them up there for them. And um, make a very, very long story short, the gallery itself was run by someone who was, uh, had a mental health challenge and they were a really great person. She was a great artist, but her challenge was you know, kind of impeding her, uh, our, the progress of the gallery. And through a series of events, they finally asked me if I wanted to take it over. And um, at first I didn't want to do that because I was making money going around. That's how I made my living. You know, I was doing art shows and I'd have to travel here and go there and sell my paintings and do commissions and all the stuff that goes along with being an artist. And, uh, but then again, I, I, I had been, I felt indebted to uh, my, my creator that uh, somehow I had been healed through the process of recovery and art and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll just give it a shot. I'll do it for a couple of months or a year, get them started and get the gallery on the go and, and you know, and we'll go from there. Well, that was 1996. The gallery turned into a, what they call a recovery community organization. We used to be called a COS, Consumer Operated Services, or PROs, Peer Recovery Organization. And uh, we are currently in the business, as a matter of fact, um, we just did a renovation for uh, it's roughly $800,000, almost a million dollar renovation in our center. And it's really, really going to be something. We haven't had the grand opening yet, but uh, you know, if you, it's called Sandusky Artisans Recovery Community Center. So keep your eyes and ears open for it. It'll probably be somehow uh, publicized in some way, shape or form. So people would know that it's going to be a grand reopening. Um, and so I took my art there and uh, we did art classes. And, uh, you know, I, I started to uh, really start to fit in the community of Sandusky. Uh, I, I lived in Sandusky, I grew up in Cleveland, but um, I had really, never really 
thought myself like a person that really lived in Sandusky, I kind of always kind of had this feeling I was a Clevelander. But as time went on, and as Sandusky Artisans Recovery Community Center became part of Sandusky, uh, we got we got to be the uh, like one of the cornerstones. We we're in downtown Sandusky, in the heart of the uh, you know historic district, and like I said, we just got this really wonderful renovation project going on, and our gallery is going to be really superb. And we're going to have all kinds of meetings there, twelve step meetings, uh, recovery meetings. Uh, uh, outreach, we get everything that goes on, any kind of a federal community organization. My point is that yeah, this would have never happened. None of this, this would have ever happened if I hadn't been a person who did art and thought that art could heal. And over the years, I think we've gotten to be pretty well known as far as um, what our organization does. We have done multiple art shows. We did a recovery. We did this art project. I'm going to guess, and this is a guess, but I think it's a pretty accurate guess, that we've probably done about 2,000 recovery masks. And how this started was everybody would come into our, our gallery, and they would be people in recovery. And I don't want to talk too long. I want to make sure, make sure I get a, a good time for the other participants. Um, but the um, people would say, well I'm, well, I'm not an artist. I'm not you. I can't sell art. I don't, I'm not as good as you are, or whatever they would say. And I'd say, everybody's an artist. Now, you may be an artist from making bread, or, 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 or doing your garden, or sewing, or working on your automobile, or whatever you do. And if you do that as a, as a, as a life experience, your life will become a masterpiece. So if you live your life as a masterpiece, um, it kind of expands. It's not, it becomes who you are. It's not something you do. Like, it's not like work, it becomes who you are. And so we did this mask project and uh, we would take just a simple mask. We bought these masks. We probably have done, I'm guessing 2000 masks over the subsequent 10 years that we've been doing this. And, and we would have people take this blank mask and we would say to them, what I want you to do is I want you to take this mask and I want you to make a representation of what, what it, either whatever your substance use or your mental health challenge did to you or what recovery means to you or both. And please put that on this mask. And if you would like to, on a little you know, index card or, or, or poem or whatever you would want to do, please go ahead and explain what the mask means to you. And like I said, we have done over 2,000. We've done it at the Wakaba's uh, recovery conference. And it's been, I, I think it's always a great turnout because we always had the rooms filled. But the point is, is that um, art heals. Um, I'm known as the visionary imagist, by the way. If you notice in the background when my paintings are scrolling back and forth, you'll be the, you'll see visionary images. And that's my, what, how I kind of, that was what I was told I was by someone else. And I thought, that's a pretty nice thing to say to somebody. And I thought, I think I'll kind of steal that and use it as my, uh, my logo and my, uh, my name on uh, the internet, interwebs and uh, some visionary images. But my point again is, is that if, uh, you, if you think you can't do something, you know, don't sell yourself short. I didn't really start pursuing my art career until my late 40s. I, in mid forties to late forties, I didn't think I didn't I never I never really conceived myself as an artist, even though I was doing art and I was selling art, but I never really thought of myself that way. So my point is, I sold myself short. I really did, and and I don't want I would not want you to do that. And, and I would ask you to live your life as a as a masterpiece. You know, give yourself the room to expand. Um, or let your creative ability um, come forth. I would tell people that at the tip of my fingers, when I would hold the brush in my hand, at the point where the brush bristles would touch the canvas, there's this, there's this continuation from the tip of that brush through my hand, up my arm, into my heart, and out into space to where the creator is. And, and that creator would pursue that 
inspiration through me. I would become, I would become a vehicle for my creator to allow me to take this blank white canvas and then turn that into like what's behind me and here in the showing. You know, to this day, I'm always amazed that I have the, the blank white canvas ends up being something like that. And I really don't attribute that ability to necessarily to myself. I mean, I'm just the instrument that brings that about, but it is the creator himself that has allowed me to create, to be a part of creation and to use my, my art as a vehicle. And, you know, I'm guessing last year, well, not, I shouldn't say last year because COVID happened, but the year before, we had about, I think it was like 14,000 people come through our center. Now, some of those people are seeking recovery and some people just come in to see the artwork that's there. Now, we don't, we don't promote that our place is artists in, even though they are artists in recovery. We don't promote it as such. We are artists. We're, we're much more than whatever our diagnosis may be or whatever, or whatever our challenge may be in life. We are artists and we are as equal to everyone else that's out there. And I try to promulgate that into people's lives. Live your life as a masterpiece. No matter what you are doing, whatever you, when you are doing what you were called to do, time will stand still. You will follow your bliss. When I would sit down to do a pain, I, time would just literally go by without me even calculating how much time I had spent. And when I, once I realized that, what I was finding was when I was in that moment, that was my bliss point. My bliss point was allowing me to be who I was meant to be. Um, in recovery, there's a second step. And for those who are not familiar with all the steps, I would just say that the second step says restore us to, us, to sanity. And it says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, and when I think about that second step, I think about the word restore. And this, the, rest, the restoration process for people that are in recovery, I believe, this is just me speaking now. The word restore, if you look it up, it has many definitions. But one of the definitions is to bring back to original condition. That's one of the definitions in my life, in the dictionary. And what that means is each and every one of us have been given the moment of creation. Our creator has allowed us to come forth in this moment. And we have been called to do something, whatever that may be. And we may not even realize what that is. Our creator has done that. And so in that second step, I was called at late age, in the mid, mid 40s, late 40s, to become what I had become to start this industrial artisans recovery community center, not even knowing that that was what was happening. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, follow your bliss. If you think you're an artist, that's all you need to be. Believe in yourself, believe in what your creator has given you, the gift of life itself. And give your life, live your life as an art masterpiece. Give back to your creator what you were called to be done and do. And I hope that gives some inspiration for people that are struggling to become artists or thinking that they may want to be. I'm just telling you, give, give yourself the breath of your creation from your creator to allow you to become the person you were called to be. And I, I, I think that's it for me. I think I did about 15 minutes there, am I right? I hope I didn't go too long. No, so that's, thank, that's you all for listening. thank you all for listening to me and listening to an old man who really still thinks in creative waves. Um, and uh, this is my Jackson, that's me. That's my Jackson Pollock. So remember visionary images. If you ever want to look me up, visionary images, uh, um, and you'll, you'll probably see my see me, Joey Sapina. Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Joey, so much for sharing your story and your art with us today. Um, next, we have our keynote speaker, Amy Wiseman. Amy is a visual artist, culture changer, and founder of the Returning Artists Guild, a network of currently and formerly incarcerated artists. 
Amy works as an arts administrator by day, a student by night, and an artist all the time. Her work deals with the impacts of implications of incarceration, addiction, and societal infrastructure through material, exploration, and community action. So Amy, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I seem distracted. I had a second camera going for the drawing part of this and I lost it. So we might have to wing, wing that part. So everybody uh, just bear with me if you can. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of background about, about myself and then we're gonna watch a short film that I made while I was incarcerated. And I just need to make the statement now that the film is kind of graphic. So um, if you're easily triggered, this is probably not something great to watch. There is substance abuse in the film. Um, but yeah, I think actually I will probably share the film first and then dive deep because I don't want to give you guys too much before you get to see it. So let me um, come back, Zoom. I lost my bar. One second. All right. Hey girl. I'm about to go re up. I got a couple tunes in. Shit. Chris. What's wrong with you? Going to rehab today. Yeah. No, man, I'm serious. I can't do this shit no more. Call me when you get out. Go to rehab, not jail. It's goodbye forever, man. Make sure you save my number.
Can I help you? Uh, yeah, my name's Rachel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to call you back. Okay. Did you set up an assessment for today? Fill this out. Um, I've never done this before. I don't know. Rachel, we're going to do an assessment for the Second Chance Center. <clears throat> Can I ask you a few questions? And this will take at least an hour. Have you used in the last 24 hours? Um, yeah. What and how much? Heroin, about a gram. Bathrooms to the left. Leave your sample at the drop box. Why is there no current address on here? They told me because I'm homeless. Hey, when I called here yesterday. You need to have some kind of proof of address. I can't process an assessment without proof that you're a Hamilton County resident. But I am a Hamilton County resident, okay? I live right by the river. But listen, I don't know who you talked to, but they should have told you to get some paperwork from the shelf. No, no, okay? No. I've been, I've been hurt there before. I can't go back there, okay? Just please help me. Look, I can't get you a bed. Not an address, period. Hey, but I do want to help you. Mm -hmm. If you call this number every day, somebody will help you out. Have another day, okay?
<laughs> so I'm not gonna let the credits run the whole way, but some of those credits are important. Um, <clears throat> I know that that film is like a lot. So if anyone needs time to, to think about that and to tune me out, I totally understand. Um, and also please feel free to put questions or comments or whatever into the Q and A and I'll get at them or get some help getting at them um, because I know that usually people want to know more. Um, so I think I'll start by backtracking just a little bit. I am 33 years old now. I had a nine-year-old daughter, um, but when I was a teenager, I had a lot of kind of instability in my life. Um, and so that was the, the era that I became essentially a junkie was at the age of 16. So to backtrack even further than that, you can think about where I often think about the roots of my family, uh, the roots of alcoholism in my family, the, the roots of domestic violence that are in both sides of my family, uh, in the ways in which I grew up watching people problem solve and the way I grew up watching people kind of handle their emotions and how that just became a little bit like second nature to me. And I think that I had a lot of personal insecurities and things I didn't like about myself and just maybe normal teenage struggles, but it became a perfect storm of, of things for me in my life that caused me to kind of just be very interested in drugs. I mean, I, I don't really like the narrative that is um, like someone had to lead me astray or something like that. Like that's not really what happened in my case. I mean, I was actively interested um, in drugs and alcohol and it just very quickly became the only coping skill that I had and kind of led me down a path. So what I'm gonna do now is start sharing a PowerPoint. And this part I think will be a little bit more fun. And we're gonna just talk about um, the recovery as much as possible and not waste a ton of time talking about um, the addiction part. Let's see, we'll put on presenter mode. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> this picture on the left is my daughter about the age she was when I first lost custody of her. Um, the year before I went to prison was pretty chaotic. I was in just a, a really abusive relationship, uh, having problems with housing. I was living out of a hotel. Um, I was found as the addict of the two parents, even though we were both addicts. And so I had to lie about my partner's use of drugs and about his violence so that I was able to kind of maintain this relationship with my kid. And I think that that last year of dealing with children's services and then um, the robbery, which led me to becoming incarcerated was maybe the worst year of my life. Although I had experienced homelessness a number of times prior to that, I had a number of what people would probably call rock bottom kind of things happen to me that didn't really bottom me out. Um, but so the, the start of the process with, with my daughter is where it got complicated. Um, the year before I went to prison, when she was about four months old, um, I was in like a domestic altercation with her father and broke my ankle. And, and when I was pregnant with my daughter, I should say that I was on Subutex, I was primarily a heroin addict. And so um, when I got pain medication for the broken ankle, I was removed from the Subutex caseload and Suboxone caseload. And so that was like the immediate push for me to go back out um, to heroin with a four month old, because I had, a, I had a habit, right? Like you can't just cut someone off of a, of a stabilizer in terms of an opiate. So that last year just led to uh, a lot of problems. And then the photo that you see on the right here is me the week that I was released from prison. This is the first photo that you know we got to take together and it's a terrible photo, but um, just gives you a sense of the time lapse there. Um, I'm gonna show you a lot of these prison pictures because it's something that I think about in my work. Um, and it's also an important time um, for me. So. What happened in these years while I was away uh, was that there was finally 
an impetus um, or something painful enough to cause me to reevaluate my role in all of my behaviors and choices and um, what I potentially wanted out of life. So when I first went to prison, I was in maximum security. I did like a 23 hour a day um, lockdown at first, and then it became a 21 hour a day lockdown. And I, I did that amount of time. I did time like that for two years. Um, and so that was a place for me to start to build skills and reflect um, because I had this tremendous pain of missing family, missing my daughter grow up. Um, and I needed to find some skills to fill that void and to process what was going on with me. And so art making started as journaling, as um, bracelet making. You see my daughter's got a little bracelet on in this photo. Um, I would make her cups, cards. I would buy work from other artists that were inside that were making teddy bears or kind of anything I could use to connect with her was my primary thinking about art making. Um, but as time went along, I realized that the women around me were really interested in art making. Um, and just a side note, I guess, about the, the population of women that are incarcerated. It's something like 75% or more uh, of the women have both a mental health, a health issue and a substance abuse issue, um, as well as like a tremendous amount of trauma. So in that space, I, you know, I started looking around and realizing like everyone here is traumatized. All of these women have been victims of something or other. Um, and some of us have been perpetrators as well, right? That's a real conversation. I'm not trying to um, take anything away from that. I'm just saying what I what I saw was that I was just surrounded by um, a bunch of people that were really, really hurting and had experienced tremendous pain prior to even being in an environment uh, like prison. And so the art making for me very quickly became like, okay, I will sit in the rec room and work on these projects. And then other people will want to work on them with me. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it became a ticket diversion program initially, just in my small maximum security unit. If a person were to get in trouble for a very minor offense or something that should be ignored, the sergeant would say, um, you know, go to one of Amy's art classes and I'll drop the ticket. And that became um, a program that actually uh, was available to the whole compound. So there were nine facilitators that were working teaching art therapy and we had three classes a week with three different syllabuses um, and the waiting list was never not overflowing for um, access to that program. So it was really great. It taught me a lot about, I think, advocating for myself. It helped me um, taking on the label of artist helped me replace the label of like junkie and addict very concretely in a way that nothing else could really do that for me. Um, and so it was like a label I could be proud of and it, it started to help me redefine my identity um, around positive things. And here's some examples of maybe some of like the first kind of things that I did. I was using very limited materials. So it was like drawings, um, little bit of painting, but I didn't, didn't have any painting skills, you know, so I just taught myself things slowly by tracing or um, observation and, and just erasing. <laughs> um, later on into my sentence, I got pretty uh, overwhelmed, I think, with with the problems of incarceration and with the problems of um, like police violence specifically um, and how that, how that was like filtering into my everyday awareness. Um, and this was like 2015, 2016, I believe when I was working on these. And so um, the household names at that time were like Eric Garner and um, Trayvon and Samir Rice, these people. And the women and girls were kind of getting lost in that narrative. Um, but yeah, I'm surrounded by women and girls who have ourselves experienced levels of police violence and institutional violence and whose 
um, family members and communities have been, um, in some cases, just destroyed by those things. And so um, I started working on a series of portraits for the Say Her Name campaign, which is what you see here. Um, so um, on the left is Corinne Gaines. Um, in the middle, the all blue, that's Melissa Williams. She's from Cleveland. Some of you may remember the um, story with her. Sharice Francis is above her. Rikia Boyd is on the right-hand side. These are two more, these are um, girls. So um, Darnisha Harris on the left and Ayanna Stanley Jones on the right. And what I realized through doing these was A, I was teaching myself how to draw um, and how to paint. And also um, that in terms of like recovery, there's a really big, big thing that happens around, I think, empathy. And a lot of people that work through like a more traditional process, like the steps will eventually come to a point of amends making and they'll have changed behaviors and, and things like that. So that they're living in a way that really is empathetic towards the people that are around them, right? Like recentering themselves in community and uh, as an impact person, as a change maker, um, and as someone that will put in work. And that's kind of how I started to see art, you know, as A, a gift I could give through teaching, um, but B, also a way for me to, to talk about things that are really important, to make work that's meaningful, um, and to give back in some kind of weird way. Um, so the portraits will come up again later. <laughs> These pieces are what I would consider the point where I started like really trying to make um, fine art and, and do something different. The, the piece on the left is just whatever, is something that I was looking at and interested in. The piece on the right um, is the God of Mass Incarceration. And so I built a series of what I considered capitalist gods and I, screen printed this one off of a lunch tray um, in prison. And I also taught some other people how to um, do that screen printing process with those tools. And he has since become the logo for the Returning Artists Guild, which is really great to see some of these things like come full circle or get back out of the gates and live another life of their own. Um, this is a series of postcards I made at the tail end of my sentence. I kind of had been going through this process and trying to get out and um, I was supposed to be released and I was like gonna go home and Liv was gonna start kindergarten and I was gonna be there for her birthday and all of these kind of like things that I had been holding on to mentally. Um, and then I went to court and they were like, ah, uh, technicality, you gotta go back for like 74 more days. Um, which after five years is not a long time, but it just, it was kind of like the, bra that, the straw that broke the camel's back for me a little bit mentally during that time. Um, and so I made these postcards because all I had was pen and ink and a little tiny bit of red paint. Um, but and these are now hanging in MoMA in New York, I should mention that. So there's a branch, uh, the PS1 branch, MoMA Queens is having a show called Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And I'm one of the featured artists, which is really crazy because when I was making these in a cell, I never um, imagined that they would be in MoMA. But I think that these are all really good examples of how I use uh, my work to kind of deal with my feelings or what's going on. And that was the piece that I didn't have um, when I was using, you know, I didn't have any tools <laughs> to deal with like the, the ick inside or the frustration with the outside or just, um, just knowing how to like stay in the flow. And so um, I have a lot of problems with folks that say prison saved my life. Like I'll never, ever, ever say that. What I can say is that I made the most of the time that was afforded to me. Uh, I still wish every day that 
that was not a thing that happened in my life because of the tremendous impact. I mean, I'm still, still trying to put the pieces back together. Um, and I've been home three years. The relationship with my daughter is forever changed. I mean, it's just not at all what it could or should have been. And so I have a lot of issues with like thinking that incarceration is the only solution to addiction because it seems like that must be the thought process. Um, and I've seen some legislation that has come out, you know, while I was incarcerated even now. And a lot of times that legislation talks about nonviolent drug offenders, right? You've heard that term probably nonviolent drug offenders, but like those aren't the folks that really go to prison. And if you do go to prison for a nonviolent drug case, you are there for a year or less. So like, it's kind of wasting resources on people that don't need it. And, and what I would hope the takeaway from this would be is that uh, violent crime is pretty typically drug crime as well. My crime was a robbery. I had a pocket knife, like an actual pocket knife. And I got an eight year sentence for that crime. And I did not get away either, by the way. So if you can imagine uh, that, right, as an actual drug crime, that's what it was based on. The, the evening of the robbery was like, get money for drugs or don't come back to this hotel. So I think that by telling my story and by, by talking about incarceration, I don't want the recovery piece to get lost, but I also don't want the incarceration piece to get lost because so much of what I've seen is that Folks that have a drug problem eventually uh, commit a crime that sends them to prison and the resources are not enough. It's not a recovery community. It's not a therapeutic environment. It's not rehabilitative. It's none of those things, um, even on its best days or in its best uh, cell blocks or in its best program. It's not that. And so a lot of what I do now is like, trying to reach back in um, and, and give the people that are there some hope and, and some life just through seeing that my life has gone on at least um, while theirs may be stopping um, and that they're still valuable. So slide to the next. This is me and my best friend. She and I started uh, the Returning Artist Guild together. Her name's Kamisha Thomas. I got out just slightly before she did so this is a photo of me and her uh, while she was kind of waiting to get released down in Franklin County. And then this is a photo of us about a year later um, at our mentor's film premiere at the, inter uh, the Chicago International Film Festival. So, you know, um, just a, a nice comparison as to what I think uh, the false idea of who people in prison are, what, what they are, what they look like, they act like, et cetera. Um, pretty much regular, regular folks that had a bump in the road. Um, so Kamisha and I, upon release, immediately felt like we needed to continue community for the artists that were inside, as well as the people that had been released, um, that we had built this kind of family and support system that just totally evaporated outside of the gate, and we didn't want to see that happen. Um, so we built the Returning Artist Guild. And then I started making some work when I came home. This is a good example of the stuff I tried to do at first. Tried to make some very commercial work. I was like, oh, people like flowers and trees and stuff. I should try to make that stuff. Um, and it like sold, but I didn't like any of it. Um, and so then I started working on things that I thought maybe would matter again. So this is the first piece I think I really completed that I would consider a part of like my body of work now. And it's called Next Time Kill Me. And it's pr pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> pretty self-explanatory in the title. I, I feel like Next Time Kill Me is um, about the takeaway that I had when I was uh, originally released. You know, it just felt like too many living deaths in a row. Addiction, addiction is such a living death. Um, prison was such a living death. And then release was just like another death of a kind that I just I could no longer really handle it. And I was very fascinated with hashtags. Um, that was something like I missed when I was gone. And so I came back out to like everybody, not only using hashtags, but saying the word like 
oh, hashtag that's funny or whatever. I, I just, I couldn't get over it. Um, so that's part of the reason that there's so many of them on here. But essentially this piece is just like um, a chess match between two figures. One is the bitch, you see her on the left. Um, she's pretty graphic. The one on the right is the big dog on the yard. And the dog is kind of like the head and it's got like a snake arm and a uniform on. And I, I think this is a pretty good sum up of what it feels like to be uh, a woman who's incarcerated. I mean, there's a lot of exploitation and um, the sexualizing of the body. And then there's also a lot of pressure to be like tough and like you have it together. And I think sometimes there's also that pressure in recovery. And what I mean is, I should be careful how I say this. What I mean is I think that sometimes it's hard. It's really hard to be transparent. Um, it's really hard to admit something if you think it's gonna like take away all your clean days or if you think it's gonna embarrass you in front of your community um, or whatever. And so, you know, I think the one thing that really works for me is that I have a level of transparency in my artwork it's a place where I can develop a language for things that I maybe don't feel ready to share. Um, but also, you know, like going back to Kamisha, just making sure that there's always at least one person in my life that knows absolutely 100% of the truth about what I'm doing. So it's probably not my boss, right? It's definitely not my mom. Um, and it may not be, at, at times it may not be her, but there has to be someone for me that knows like the totality of every of everything of all the loose ends and all the, the things that I'm struggling with um, so that if there starts to be like a a drift or a slide or some uncomfortableness that there's the safety net of another human being around um, because asking for help was just like not a skill that that I had in my addiction it certainly wasn't one that I gained while I was away. And so it's something I still have a hard time with. It's just like saying that I'm struggling with, with a thing or asking for resources, you know, like I probably qualify for more resources than what I try to get because I have such a, a fear or a boundary around like seeming like I need help or um, support. So that's just like one of my triggers. It's one of the things that I kind of have to watch. Um, and I think it's why the artwork works there's a language. This is kind of cool. This is um, a little bit thinking about the drawing exercise that we're gonna try to do, which I'm not sure how we're gonna do it without this camera. You'll have to bear with me when I adjust my computer. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the piece on the left is literally just like a colored background and a drawing over top of it. The piece on the right is just like an embellished version of that drawing. So. That's something that I've done a few times is make a piece, print it, come back and, and layer it and play with it, excuse me, and just continue to work on it. And I think that that's just become a big part of my process is touching something over and over and over again, um, changing materials, thinking about um, surfaces and how it feels, how it looks, you know, I like to use a lot of color in my work. And I think that's because I started making work when I was incarcerated. So it was just maybe the only place that I had access to color was, was in material like colored pencils. And so I just developed a style that's a lot louder than um, my personality, but say la vie. Um, so thinking about just staying on top of something, sitting with it, um, struggling through it, so much of my work gets destroyed um, in the process. And I think that that is very akin to me using this as a recovery tool. Um, there are times where I will go in and, and destroy a piece entirely based on mood, or, um, you know, I have some kind of lingering thought about something, something has bothered me. So now I need to go and like destroy something or create something. 
Oops, sorry. This is the work that I started. Uh, the one on the left is a mugshot of mine. Um, this was me kind of like trying to teach myself how to do Photoshop after never having done it and then not even understanding technology, but it was a good experiment. And uh, the one on the right is a self portrait as well. It's just drawn with chalk. But I really started to like understand why I do some of the things that I do in my work and what I'm kind of trying to talk about. And so like the importance of the mouth being sewn up um, or the importance of there always being kind of one dead eye, things like that. Um, these two pieces, and I'm really sorry you guys were like how these are cropped in here. I know the like crops are crazy. I just, I was at capacity with this <laughs> PowerPoint. So the piece on the left is a wolf in sheep's clothes and the title is The Middleman. And I perceive him as both a drug dealer and a parole officer. Um, and what I mean by that is when I, when I was released, I felt like there were two gatekeepers um, that I was wholly beholden to this parole system and all of the obligations of that important, petty, or otherwise. And then also that there was this other kind of gatekeeper, like that, um, you know, the, the idea of a drug dealer or, or getting back into that kind of lifestyle, or the idea of like a used car salesman, maybe, and kind of like not getting a good deal wherever you're going, or like having to, having to do a buy here, pay here, because like, you can't get financed any other kind of way, because like, you're a recovering addict and a felon and like you have no work history and terrible credit and um so yeah I think this piece for me was just a lot thinking a lot about gatekeeping and and what was standing in my way of of a happy productive life right of being like a fully invested citizen um and on the wolf too, on his pinstripe suit, there's also um, a portrait of my daughter. And I think that I used her face on the suit to kind of talk about um, that I was fleeced out of that relationship in a, in a way. And that's just kind of like what that is. Uh, the one on the right is the good cop, When Pigs Fly. Um, probably should just leave that one at that and move on. But he was also part of the series. And, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about police, I never really liked the argument about thinking about an individual police officer as, as good or bad. Um, I think it's better to look at the institution as a whole. And I think that um, anyone who does that with open eyes can see how problematic uh, policing in this country is. This is the returning citizen and she's a fish out of water. Um, she's got this goofy crown and this baited hook and um, this was definitely one that when I finished I was like yep that's exactly what it feels like like you think you're coming home to whatever you've imagined that you're coming home to and and none of that is real. Like the life that you had before is no longer real. The one in front of you isn't what you thought. Um, and you just kind of don't know what to do. And it's a, a really, really tricky time. And it's a tricky time in recovery. Like, um, you know, and mine wasn't perfect either. I should say that. Like, I don't count days or years anymore. Um, I know that I haven't done heroin in over eight years, but I've had drinks. I've smoked, you know, I've had moments where um, I felt like a substance was like the thing that was going to help me. And I can't say that it did help. It did not. Um, but I can say that, like, at least being honest about, you know, like, oh, I did this thing, helped me get over those kind of bumps a lot faster, right? And instead of being like, oh, drinking is my new solution now, it was like, oh, that's a line, you know, I had forgotten maybe, but now I'm reminded that that's a line. And so I try to just be really open and honest about how the process has been for me. 
and I don't know fully why I think that uh, I don't think about heroin anymore or anything like that. The only thing that really sticks in my mind when I think about like, why did I not go back out? Why did I not relapse? Why have I not returned to prison, et cetera? And I honestly think it just was like, I had had every experience that that drug had to offer me. Uh, had a lot of fun with it in my youth. I became homeless. Like I had experienced all of these really bad relationships and um, circumstances where I should have been dead many times over. Um, and I think I just finally got a belly full. And that's a really hard thing to impress upon folks because so often, especially when I share the film, people will say like, what is your, you know, advice for like the moms or the family members or whatever. And it's, it's really hard to say something other than like, just hold on, you know, like things kind of have to run their course. And I think that that was something that had to run its course in my life. There was no turning back the clock. Um, and so because of that, I now focus my efforts on people who are on this side of it, like myself, who are trying to stay over here. And then the youth, you know, because there's so much potential there um, to reach back into those kids and to speak some life. And so that's kind of where I'm at. But in terms of just like being in the thick of addiction, it is, it is really rough and it feels very much like a, just hold on. Um, the first thing that the Returning Artist Guild did when we got together, we had this great event um, at Cloud City. The premise behind this event was what if a city was built by artists? So I built a jail um, for the event, but you can see it's pretty like sparkly and stuff. Um, I don't have pictures of the wall that you're not seeing, which was covered in art. Um, but this was really great. We had games, we had a contraband game. So you had to guess whether or not an item was contraband. Um, we had Make It Spark, which was two batteries and two razor blades. And could you make a spark or not? And The Price is Right, which is just like a commissary version of that game, which was really, really great. And it was one of our first kind of public interfacing things. And, and we met a lot of people and made a lot of great connections. We had a follow-up show at 934 Gallery here in Columbus, which was really great. Um, probably feature the work of about 30 currently and formerly incarcerated artists in, you know, many of them in recovery as well. Um, this is another picture from that day of the group, or most of us, kind of the core people in this photo. Um, and just kind of like doing that work of being around other people has meant a lot of stability and support, support for me in my own recovery. It seems like, um, you know, to keep it, you give it away. I didn't say that in the AA way, but that's like one of their things, like to keep what you have, you give it away. And it's really, really true. Um, so our community is like blossoming, which is great. I'm really proud of everyone. The outcome of that show was that I got a studio space. Um, and that's the first time I've ever had a studio space. So I decided I was gonna work large. So the piece you see here is about nine feet long. It's still behind me. I'm still working on it. I've been working on it for almost two years now. <laughs> it's like kind of insane. I need to stop. I've, um, I've ruined it more than once. Um, but anyway, what was really cool about this for me was that uh, my daughter got to help me kind of like start this piece. So um, a lot of her drawings are on here and they're still on here and they're still preserved. And that uh, was just something really special for me, like A, to have space to work large and not be cramped in a cell, and then B, to like have art become this way that I could spend time with and communicate with my daughter was really great. This is a version of it where it probably could have stopped. Um, but now it's in the process of being embellished. So it's got a lot more texture to it. And, you know, the theme of this piece, if you can kind of imagine with me for a second, is that it's like a roller coaster, but it's also like a razor wire fence. And so within this space is contained 
spaces like inside prisons and spaces outside prisons, but it's kind of all um, in this loop. And the hangman in the center says, you chose this. And, you know, that was something that was like repeatedly drilled into our brains when we were incarcerated, right? Like anytime something was unfair or anytime there was like a problem, they would say, you chose to come to prison. You know, you chose this, you chose this, you chose to be here, you chose this. Um, and it was like a, a broken record for sure. Like no one was hearing that because like, in reality, no one chooses to come to prison. You know, you may choose to make a, commit a crime, but you may not even have that much choice in that act, really, for some outside of that, right? So it's just kind of a message that was like drilled in. And I think it was drilled in about addiction too. Like everyone expects you to um, use your willpower and like turn it around. And that's not really how that worked for me. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a time in the, I was on heroin for like eight years straight. So maybe in the first three years, I was totally not interested in recovery. I think that's true. I was still enjoying myself for the most part. Um, for like the, the last five years, I don't think there was a day that I didn't want to not be doing what I was doing. You know, I just like, I hated it. It was such such a chore, such a burden and, and so unhappy and, and not real, no real connection. But, you know, the idea was that like I had chosen that life. And so the way I think about it now is um, thankfully I have enough distance on it that my body is not in control of my brain anymore and I can choose again. And so now I think a lot more concretely about what my choices are. If, if all of my choices are, are really mine, um, then I need to act like it. And so sometimes that makes people mad, you know, in my recovery, it's not, it's about not been easy. There are choices that I have made that were the right choice for me, but other people didn't understand. You know, there are things that I've done to protect myself, um, relationships that I don't really engage in or people that I don't engage with in the same way that I used to. And I think all of that is great. You know, art was this place for me to develop autonomy. These canvases, these spaces are the first things that I was ever fully in control of, I felt like, um, from start to finish. And if I want to destroy them, I can destroy them. And it's nobody's business. And so I think, you know, again, like this art, art just gave me such a space to be myself um, that it, it freed my mind from those other concerns. This is kind of like a closer image of what it looks like now, but it still doesn't really look, look like this. You can see that this guy's face is like the shape of Ohio now. Oh, you can't see it. I don't know what's happening, um, but we're working on that one. This uh, is one shot. I have the final, but this one might be better. So I included this as an example of like how I destroy my own work, but um, don't care. So this is a piece I made for my grandma. Um, she passed last March 17th, actually. So we're coming right up on it. Um, and it's called Her Body is the Platform, The World in One Kitchen Sink for Carol. And when she passed away, like I didn't realize that was gonna rock me to my core the way that it did. I also ended uh, my relationship. I broke off an engagement, I moved out, grandma passed away and then COVID kind of started really like the lockdown started. Um, and so I just was kind of like, again, at a place where I was swimming with a lot of grief and had to have an outlet. And so this is what um, I made. And the premise behind this piece is that there are like two golden shores kind of, and then that these group of figures or beings or whatever they are, um, are kind of in this linear transition, you know, from point to point death is there, ferrying them across the sea, whatever. Um, but then it's also contained in this rectangle, which is meant to be a kitchen sink, and that her body is kind of in the background. You kind of see a figure floating there, hopefully. Um, and her vagina is the train, right? Which is like a little weird to say out loud, but in my thinking, I was just thinking about um, women being this, this powerful landscape that kind of life and death just flows through and that 
um, in my grandma's case, it kind of was just like all swirling down um, the drain of the kitchen sink at the end of the night because she was such a traditional woman. She spent so much time in her kitchen um, and like cooking and baking and doing those things that we um, think about specifically with like the role of a grandma or a mom. She was very much that woman um, and I'm not. So I have fond memories of it. This is kind of like what it looks like now. Um, but this is a weird image because of the lighting, but you know, I went back in kind of like a fit of rage and added all of this crazy gold. And um, I felt like I needed to obscure her a little bit more and like hide her body. And, you know, so it's just, I only show this to show that like, I really have no idea what I'm doing. I constantly make a mess um, and feel very okay with that and feel absolutely no obligation to make things uh, look more realistic or, or anything like that. But, you know, when you're a single mom, you're in school full time, you're working pretty much full time, you have all of these other obligations. People see you spending time in your studio, like they think of it as selfish right? or like um, as a waste of time or you know maybe as a glorified hobby but for me like this is like therapy if I don't do this part none of the other parts will work because I won't have a place for all of my processing to happen you know I think that part of the reason that like I was attracted to drugs really early on in the first place is because I struggled to know how to process I did not understand how to take an event that happened to me or around me and like think about that and like be a grown up and repress it and ignore it or whatever. Like I just couldn't do that. So I always had this like chaotic kind of energy. And so now I'm like, oh, I'm just a creative person. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with me. I'm just a creative person. And so um, just big love to people that make space for creativity because it's something we really have to do. If you do it the way that many artists do it, it's, it's not like something we want to do. It's what we absolutely have to do. Um, so over the summer, speaking of what we have to do, uh, I made some, some signs, contributed to some public art. Um, on the left, top left is Angela Davis, we must be anti-racist. Um, and the bottom is Audre Lorde, your silence will not protect you. Those are both um, women that I was introduced to while I was incarcerated just through reading. Um, I read a lot of interesting, um, yeah, like intersectional feminism and things like that, that just kind of started filling in gaps for me and in, in my experience as a white woman and some of the um, barriers that I had experienced or some of the stereotyping that maybe I had experienced. Also my experience as like um, a person living on the street or a person addicted to drugs. So I had like an idea of what it's like to be discriminated against, right? But I didn't know how to put that in the context of like what was happening to my sisters around me and so um you know, I really credit both of these women to kind of just like teaching me how to think and then um on the right is a wheat paste that I did from the portraits that I made while I was in prison so I, I took those portraits from the say her name campaign that I made in 2016 and then I just had them all printed out in 2020 because there was um no reason not to, none of those women had received justice. And so uh, I just went on like a, a wheat pasting campaign and we'll probably continue to do more of that work um, as much as I can without like jeopardizing my job, right? Or like things like that. Um, I'm showing you guys this image. This is like a very, very first um, process shot. And it's kind of similar to how I'm gonna ask people to draw today. And I just want you to like look around, maybe notice like the figure on the left, like the scarecrow kind of guy or the figure on the right and see how like sketchy that is or, or how those shapes are just kind of mashed in there. And then here's a second shot of that. So this was like, this has been a touched more than once obviously. Um, at this point, but it's got a couple of layers on there. It's still not really finished, but you can kind of see how by just like going back and refining or making a mess or refining that it starts to come forward. And that's pretty much how I work. I don't really um, go in with a plan. I don't 
that's not a strong skill of mine. <laughs> Someone was like, tell me about how great you are at time management. You would never hear that story. Um, so, or artists that have like a process, you know, like a very refined, first I do this, then I do that. I'm not that person either. So I really just kind of play around until I see things. Um, this is where it's at now. I'm kind of still working through it. Um, but you get an idea of like how many times I will keep approaching. Quickly, these are two pieces that I made in collaboration with an older artist that I share studio space with. His name is Michael Halliday. Um, and I just would point out that, you know, an artist mentorship, which is what that is, also becomes a, a very personal relationship. And Halliday and I have similar issues with um, the drugs and alcohol and, and with recovery, but he's like in his late 70s and I'm in my early 30s. And so we have very different life experience, very different perspectives and very different painting styles. And so the opportunity to kind of work alongside him and learn how he paints and for him to see how I paint. And then um, also to just have another person that's kind of in my recovery network is really great because, you know, Holiday's a person that I can say like, hey, I think I wanna drink today or, or whatever. And, and to hear the laugh on the other end of the phone or whatever their response would be is like really helpful. And so I would just encourage people, art making is only one path. And I, I think that 12 step is only one path too. And so everyone has to find their way through recovery. And, and if it's like religion or, or 12 steps or art making or um, like exercise and moving your body, like whatever the thing is, that can replace that like I don't think it's terrible but you do need community so if it's if it's art you need to be around other artists you know if it's to be heavily involved in the recovery community then you know where those people are um but just like staying around people and staying honest this is a process shot of um the canvas <laughs> that I like brutalized the surface. Like even looking at the photo, I'm kind of laughing at it um, because A, I had a very small scraper. So please know that this took a lot of time. But just as like um, to point out that like ruining things is maybe the most therapeutic thing that I can do for myself is to just scrape at something for a while until I feel better. And I'm sure that like, it's a similar feeling, I think, probably to like people that box because like I will get sweaty, you know, like there will be a huge mess. Like um, it's a whole ordeal. And then I have this like thing that I'm done with, but um, I can paint it later, which I did. So you can kind of see like that I do clean up the mess eventually, but that this now has like a great surface, you know, it has such a wonderful. Um, dimension. And this piece is called Public Property Number One. And this kind of is like really about what all my work is about now, which is thinking about the materials of um, prisons, like the steel, the, the blocks, um, the cement, all of the specialty locks, all of these kind of weird images that I have in my mind of these materials and how those materials are also like bridges and schools, <laughs> roads, and, and how I see these materials now in other places and it throws me. Um, but then also how like the, the body of an incarcerated person is state property at that point. And, and in some ways, I think that translates on the outside as well, just feeling like maybe like a cog in the wheel um, is maybe like kind of what I'm trying to talk about. Like, like people as material. So not only like is the infrastructure between these places of like education and punishment, like exactly the same, but then like the people are really kind of like the fodder in both of these places that they're the raw material, whether they become material for incarceration or, or just material for like the labor force. Um, it's kind of something that I've been toying with and exploring. And then these are the reason I showed you guys all of those prison photos in the beginning. Um, these are both pictures 
um, taken from a prison photo of me and Olivia. And I think this is probably like my next wheat paste campaign. Um, just to kind of talk about like uh, the how that space and time is like missing and can't be returned. And how also like, I want it back, but, but how I was like uh, wanted at that time, like I could have been on a wanted poster and, you know, would they have put us both on there? Um, or during that time, would we have both been on the milk carton? You know, just thinking about things that are lost that, that can't be returned to me now, but how do I make an impact so that, um, you know, people aren't, women aren't still experiencing this and yeah. And then here's the picture of the Returning Artists Guild kind of last summer, uh, we had a retreat, everybody was safe, no worries, no, co no COVID, um, but we just like did it up, we had a great time and, you know, that's what it's like to have family, you know, I think that it's so important in recovery to have family. And I think that's the end of my PowerPoint. Yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, 11, 18. Okay, cool. So now I think I'm going to move my computer because I don't have my second camera. So um, Amy, I changed our settings so you may be able to get back on with your phone. So why don't we try that and just give folks a couple minutes to grab some paper, pencil, Perfect. and we'll hopefully get the second camera hooked up. Yeah, you don't need anything like super fancy. I'm using a uh, printer paper and like a pen, so. Mm, it didn't like it that time with me there. Okay. Well, it doesn't like that. So I'm just going to scoot you guys over real quick. Ignore my messy studio. <laughs> Also, if anyone has questions about the film or like how they were made or anything like that, I will. I can talk about that now. Some I know people are always like, "How did you make a film in prison?" Okay, is everyone oppressed? Oh, should I just go? This angle is like not great. Okay. So um, what I thought would be really fun is to scribble together because that is kind of the foundation of a lot of my drawings is just loosening up my hand some and, and kind of just like relaxing about trying to create something. Cause I think a lot of people that are like, oh, I can't draw. They think that they can't draw because like they don't know how to look at something through observation and then replicate that. And that's one drawing skill, but that's not like the only drawing skill. The imagination is a lot more broad than what you can see through observation. So what I typically do is like, I literally just make a mark, which I know that was like really fast, <laughs> but it kind of like gives you an idea. I like to fill up most of the paper and the only rule that I have is that I try to like balance it on one end or the other, you know, like not put all of my marks in the middle, which is a kind of like a basic art principle. But again, I wouldn't get hung up on it because I'm sure I've done it many times and liked the result. Um, so then what I do, like after I have something like this is I'll just kind of like come back and start like refining the shapes a little bit. 
So I'll be like, oh, you know, I kind of like that line. That kind of reminds me of something. Let me thicken that up. Or like, oh, I wish there was a line from here to there because I like that shape. So maybe I'll just play with that. And so I kind of just like go through a process of thickening thickening lines, which sounds weird, but yeah, that's what I do. And sometimes like at this point, I may think like, oh, this looks like a figure. Um, because they often do, right? The scribbles are very conducive to figure drawings. Um, okay, sorry. So like, if I were going to turn this into a figure, to me, it kind of looks like someone doing like a hand up pose maybe. So like I would just kind of put like a little dip in there to say this is a hand. And then like do that. Um, just do some very kind of relaxing line movements in a way. You know, like, okay, this would be a hair maybe. So I might just make lines for that. Maybe throw an eyeball in. And so like now you can see it's all like through just a couple of lines, it's taken on like the form of a figure. And even if you were gonna leave all of this craziness alone, like I think people would still kind of get it. And so this is like a really great way too, if you're interested at all in um, painting because I do this absolute same process with paint, although it's a lot more fun because I can make a way bigger mess. I can blend colors in and out. Um, I can do like a wash. So I can do something that's like very wet and kind of get like a nice thin runny look. I can slap it on in globs and use a palette knife to pull. So, but like typically when I start a painting, like I showed you in the PowerPoint, that one that was just kind of like a a rough sketch with some color behind it. That's really what all of these kind of start out off as. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Here are the places where I want to invest more time because I'm interested in, in this shape or this combination of colors or whatever. Um, I do a lot of these like weird little drawings just to if nothing else, like free up my thinking for a minute, you know, and this is how I doodle. Like if you call me and we're on the phone, this is likely what I'll be doing while you're talking, you know. Um, sometimes this is how I take notes. So, you know, like I have a sheet kind of like this next to work, but in here I'll be like, oh, <laughs> images for this file or like, oh, do blah, blah, blah task. It's just a way of, of making things more interesting for me because I think that that's maybe a little bit of my problem as a creative person is I'm like easily, I don't wanna say easily bored, I would say easily interested, you know, like just distractible maybe is like what people would think about it. It's really not like I'm distracted, I'm engaged, but I'm engaged in something else. And so this is a way for me to like kind of be engaged in other things while I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, Z. And then, you know, if you have like a cool marker, it's fun. You can do things where you play with like thin, very thin lines, very thick fat lines. Um, brief infomercial. I'm pretty sure this is the best marker on the planet. It's refillable. Um, it has the best nib in the game like even if you just mark on cardboard boxes at work or something like you need this marker <laughs> it's so great um, it is called a pilot super color you get the broad tip but yeah so just like maybe play with those shapes and play with like adding lines and then maybe you'll start to notice that there are lines you like to draw that's something i noticed a lot is that um I draw a lot of buildings and I draw a lot of uh, like razor wire and I draw, um, you know, a lot of kind of monstery looking things like 
a lot of my scribble drawings become become monsters of some kind or another, like truly horrifying <laughs> monsters. Because it's so easy, because they're scribbles, it's like they're already um, meant for, for monster making. So like another way of doing this, exact same like scribble drawing. But this is like a, like a chalk kind of material. It's not an oil pastel, but it's not as dry as a chalk. It's some kind of in-between. Crayola makes it. So that's how you know how fancy I am. Um, but like what I'll do instead of refining and thickening lines is I'll just go back and like fill spaces, maybe with shapes. Like maybe I'm gonna do rectangle shapes or something like that. But they all have like a bump on them or a triangle in. You start to get some pretty interesting, like, hmm. Okay, the color is like around, it's balanced. So then I'll typically turn it, which I suggest all of you do. I don't care how uh, far into your drawing you are, change its uh, perspective, change its portrait landscape, flip it over, I don't know, do what you need to do. But then I'll just like come back and I'll almost make the exact opposite sweep. So like avoiding places and trying to obscure some of it, but still like scribbling literally just like, hey, you don't want this thing there or like it's too unbalanced. Let me bring this down. But ultimately like, it's a, uh, I think art is like the most forgiving thing you can do depending on the media that you're working in because there's like endless potential for revision. So, I mean, if I, if I don't like something so much, I will just absolutely destroy it or paint over it. I mean, blot it out, <laughs> rip it to shreds, uh, whatever it takes to get that version that I didn't like away from me and to just start working on something else. But so like, this is kind of fun when you do the color first, and then you have to pay a little bit of attention where you put your black marks or otherwise you'll mess up your marker, right? So you're like kind of stuck, but you end up making some nice shapes, I think. And these like could, become really cool abstract paintings. Like, I think a lot of people are interested in abstract work because it matches like their, you know, color scheme in their house or whatever. It's, it's something to look at that's not telling you what it is. Um, so I like abstract work as well for that reason. I like to look at it and ponder it and really look at the surface a lot. But these kind of can do that same thing. You know, my marker is like dead. I'm just sitting here bragging about what a great marker it is. It's out of ink. But like, hopefully you can see that the process sometimes is just like refining an original mark. You, know, you make a mark, you're confident about it. Just go with it. Go with your gut, go with your scribble. It's going to be okay. Um, you might actually get something out of it. So if anyone is interested in doing um, some writing, maybe along with their doodling or instead of their doodling, the first prompt I think I was going to suggest was um, Thinking about the film, there's a line in the film where the main character says, I don't have another day. And she pushes um, the business card back. And so um, just wondering, you know, 
if you kind of use that as a stream of consciousness, if you start from a place of, I don't have another day, dot, 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 what is the end of that sentence for you? Like, what do you not have another day for? Or what do you not have another day? Like, what do you not have another day to continue to do? Or maybe what do you not have another day to wait on? Like, what is something that you need to bring in um, to your life like today? For me, it could be something as simple as like, I don't have another day to not drink the amount of water I'm supposed to drink. Like, that is, sounds corny, but it's one of those pieces in recovery that can get really lost. Taking care of yourself, time management, staying on top of um, your body so that you don't get in a place where your body is so uncomfortable that it suggests crazy ideas to you, you know? Um, so part of that is like drinking water, but I'm terrible about it. I have to like have an alarm. Um, so I kind of like try to use writing as a form of goal setting in a way, like if I'm going to spend some time and do some brain drain and, and get some feelings out, then what is the outcome of that? It's actually tangible and like useful in my life. And there's usually something. And sometimes like the, the secret is just like, you know, hold on, <laughs> it's coming, like keep going. And sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes there's a real issue that I run across through the process of writing that I'm not dealing with. This looks very odd to me. I don't know what, what is happening there. How are we doing? You got anything? We do have a couple of questions. So um, while you guys are doodling and expressing yourself, feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A and I'll just read them off as they come in. So um, we do have a film question. How did you get permission to make a film while in prison? Was there any pushback from uh, the administration or anyone within the prison? Yeah, um, so real quickly, if you guys saw what I just did, I didn't like that, so I colored over it. So just like, please give yourself permission to color over things you don't like, because um, the layers are great. And the, the process of making was pretty weird. So there was a woman, her name is Shinoya Chuku. She is, was at the time a, a professor of motion pictures at Wright State, um, but she was researching a film called Clemency, which actually won Sundance, uh, it won Best Feature Film in Sundance. Um, she was the first Black woman to do that. And I want to say it was 2019 um, that the film won, but if you haven't seen it, it's called Clemency please do yourself a favor. I'm pretty sure it's like streaming on most platforms. You can find it. Um, and so she was researching uh, for the clemency film and she came to speak to a woman who was incarcerated with us named Tyra Patterson. Tyra has uh, since received her clemency, but in the process of like getting to know Tyra, she got to know some of uh, us that were doing art and art therapy in the, in the place and thought, wouldn't it be great if you guys like got together and made a film, like you guys can make a short film. And then as we kind of went through uh, about an 18 month process of writing short stories, turning short stories into scripts, turning scripts into screenplay with director breakdown and, and all of these things, like she realized very quickly that we would all have to make our own films. And so when we had these scripts polished and ready to do that, we were matched up with a co-director that was um, either a professional or a student working like in the Dayton area and that person came in to the prison and we went through like shot lists and the script breakdown with them and and kind of got them to understand our vision for literally every single shot then we watched audition footage um, we picked out locations through uh, pictures that were shared with us and we had actors like once we selected them from the audition footage most of them were able to come in unless they were like underage. So folks that had children in their films like weren't able to work with them. Um, but like all of our adult actors pretty much came in. We did rehearsals with them. And then our co-director went out and shot the films with Chinoya 
um, in a 10 day period. So they made, they shot five short films in 10 days, which was pretty insane. And then we had about a three month process of editing those films back and forth with the Wexner Center. So there was an editor there named Paul Hill who came um, and spent time individually with each of us. We would watch the film like shot by shot, watch all of our other footage, like sub out what we wanted to sub or um, things like that. Like the end of my film was supposed to be totally different, but my director didn't get the shot. So, you know, that was something that I had to deal with in post. But it was a great experience. And there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of pushback from staff uh, on the lower echelon. You know, they felt like we were being treated too well or like we were getting something or, um, you know, prisons are a very weird environment. So if you've not experienced one, I don't, I can't probably explain it all for you here today. But there was definitely some, some staff members that were not very happy that we were having access to, to all of the things that we had access to. And we actually left the prison like three times to go and speak about the films outside and stuff like that. So it was a pretty wild ride. Um, and uh, my co-founder, Kamisha, is still making films. So she's working on a series of three short films right now. She's working on the third one, um, which hopefully will drop in 2021. And then that'll be like the next big project. And, um, you know, the Returning Arts Guild is like full of a variety of people doing different things. There's the film, there's visual arts, there's, um, you know, poetry, spoken word, fire dance, um, quite a bit of comedy improv theater guys. Uh, <laughs> So just like a good mix of different things going on. Okay. Um, a sort of related question was, Aaron noticed that you emphasized the part in the film about um, no mailing address or no permanent address being a barrier to get help. Why was that something you included or where did that inspiration come from? Oh, okay. Um, well, I was a homeless addict living in Hamilton County. And this was probably around like 2000, don't let me lie, maybe like 2008 um, when I was trying to get treatment and treatment was um, at that time, like Obamacare didn't exist or anything like that. So I wasn't able to get uh, Medicaid because I was just a young woman. I didn't have any kids at the time. And so um, I, I was homeless. I didn't want to go to shelters. I didn't like shelters. I had reasons for not wanting to be there. And I could not get into treatment on like a sliding scale or whatever because I didn't have proof of address, but there was no way for me to get proof of address because like I was unhoused. And so it was just like one of the, one of the catch 22s that was involved in my real life in terms of trying to get you know access to treatment. And that was a thing that they used to do back then. They used to say like, call this number every day, you know, and like, one of these days they're going to tell you it's your time to come down and so you would have those days where you would be kind of like you'd be out of dope and you'd be feeling sick and you'd be calling the number just like hoping that they would take you in time you know and then like it seemed like every time I would re-up or like get enough drugs to last me a couple of days or something like that that's when like they would answer the phone and then that's when I would have like no interest in going you know so there was like some of it was me, there was a back and forth for many years trying to get treatment, but a lot of it was like, I didn't have insurance and I didn't have an address and there was no getting into treatment without those um, things. Unless you went through like a, a legal system maybe or something like that. Is the art therapy program that you started while you were incarcerated still in place? It actually is, um, which, you know, so I, part of what I do now is like, I go and pick up artwork from the prison so that I can share the work at the events that I have. Um, so COVID has really kind of changed my access level, which stinks. So I don't know as much as I would like to know about what's happening with the program, but I do communicate with 15 or 20 people that are inside on a regular basis. And so I know from them pretty much what's going on. And, uh, you know, art therapy is just like, it was a bright spot um, on that compound and it's still happening, not at the scale, sadly, that uh, it was at when I left. Um, and then they're always asking us to like figure out how to do the films again. And so that's something that uh, I think Kamisha and I are actively thinking about with 
Shanoya and others, um, how can we do another round of these films for these women? All right, and then our last question that we have time for today is, um, are there any ways that you've managed your recovery during COVID that were different or new from pre-pandemic? Yeah, and this is like a level of transparency, but I'll be honest, um, you know, I started painting a little bit of graffiti this year and that was a new uh, medium for me. And it was partially driven by the fact that I lost my studio space at the beginning of the pandemic over some crazy situation uh, outside of myself and my studio partner. And so I was like, oh my God, I have to go outside. You know, I've got to find other services. I need to paint somewhere. And, and um, so I began kind of doing that. And that was like the thing that I was able to look forward to. It was kind of like the, the new excitement in my life. And I think sometimes recovery is like that. Like it gets too sad and too stale, you know, like I was going through it with my grandma and I was just like, I had all of these heavy, heavy things. And so I needed a place to like go get that out. And I really don't know what feels like more freeing than like spray paint or a bridge, which sounds like really kind of like dirty and gross. And it is like very dirty and gross most of the time. But um, there's like a sense of freedom that I got from that that felt very tangible it was like taking space back and so much of my work feels like about spaces and, and the ways that I've lost um things and so that was kind of yeah but it was like I had to develop a new skill because I didn't have studio space well um we're coming to the end of today's presentation so I think that's a really good note to end on thank you Amy so much for sharing your story and your film and your work. And um, hopefully those of you who are on today took a little bit of inspiration of how you can use your own passions or try something new to strengthen your recovery. Um, I thank you all for joining us today. We will be posting a recording of today's presentation as well as more information on the series on our website in the coming weeks. So thank you all and have a great day.